So, to the COVID inquiry. This, of course, is the UK inquiry we're talking about, but it's been sitting in Edinburgh for the past fortnight, three weeks of evidence here in total at this point. It's been sh shining a light into how the COVID crisis was handled here, and it has certainly been illuminating. One senior epidemiologist, Mark Woodhouse, part of the COVID advisory group, said the Scottish government had ignored his advice, it had frozen at crucial moments, it had misled the public, it had needlessly locked the country down. Senior government figures stand accused of destroying evidence. Indeed, opposition parties have claimed there was a culture of cover-up at the top. Oh, and of course, there was the revelation that generated endless headlines. Uh, WhatsApp messages have been used to grumble about rivals in uh, sometimes quite fruity language. But if that is a crime, I face it. I suspect, rather, lots of us would be in a great deal of trouble. Uh, some of the bereaved families say they're fed up of listening to politicians endlessly blaming each other. They say their trust in government has been shattered by what they've heard. As Fiona said, we're going to hear from them a little bit later on the radio. But is that fair? Wasn't it just a group of people striving to do their best for the country in desperately difficult circumstances? They never claimed they got everything right, after all. The inquiry will be the judge of all that in time. This morning, though, we want to dig into this a bit. Trust is, we keep hearing, the most important commodity in politics. So has it been damaged here? And what are the consequences, if so? Well, just before we came on air this morning, I spoke to the Conservative MSP Murdo Fraser and first to the SNP's Ian Blackford. I asked him if he understood bereaved families when they say they've lost trust in government. I can understand everything that the families have gone through, Martin. I think we need to go back and remember the loss that so many people faced, the fact that they couldn't be with their loved ones. And the whole point that we're having the UK review, but of course the Scottish one as well, is so that we can learn all the necessary lessons from this. It's important that we take this seriously and that we are prepared for whatever happens in the, the future as well. And that's why the former First Minister, the existing First Minister and so many other people are prepared to put them, themselves in front of that inquiry. Let's make sure that they get the answers that they deserve. Let's make sure through all of this that we demonstrate that we are worthy of the, the faith and trust of the bereaved and indeed everyone else in Scotland as well. Well, that was my question. The bereaved say they've lost that faith and trust in you and partly because they're not going to get necessarily the openness and the answers that they want because a lot of the evidence has been destroyed. Can you, my question was, can you understand why they say their trust has been shattered? Yeah, look, at the end of the day, we need to show that we're worthy of that trust. And, you know, when you talk about the information, Martin, there are 28,000 different social media documents have been provided to the inquiry. Of course, many people will come None in front from the of former the... First Minister relating to her handling of the COVID inquiry. None so, of her WhatsApps. So, so, so you know, let's, so let's deal with this, because... I know what the First Minister was doing day in, day out. Let's not forget that the First Minister did 250 press conferences over that period, putting herself in front of the public. I know that when the First Minister was taking decisions, whether it was in Cabinet or whether it was done with officials, all of that was documented. The First Minister did not routinely use WhatsApp as a mechanism to conduct her business. We, we don't over know the that anymore inquiry. because she's deleted so many of her... Well, listen, well, Ian Blackford, she gave a guarantee that she would give any and all of her messages to this inquiry. She said even if she wanted to avoid doing that and for the avoidance of doubt she didn't want to avoid doing that, she couldn't avoid doing it. Now it seems she destroyed all of them. There's no record of, of any WhatsApp messages relating to her handling of this inquiry, when, we were told. When, Why should we trust anything she says next week? Well, when, when it comes to official documents, all of that has been provided, Martin, and of course you've got all the information from the current First Minister that's been handed over as well. But crucially, a lot of the information that you're talking about has emerged from other sources. We had Liz Lloyd, for example, appear in front of the committee this week. And what you see from these, uh, these transcripts of the discussions that took place, this wasn't the decision-making process. The decision-making process happened within government, and all of that has been handed over to the inquiry. But, but sorry, I'm going to come to you in a second, Murder Fraser. I just want to interrogate this one just just a little more, Ian Blackford. My question is, why should we trust anything Nicola Sturgeon says next week if, it seems, she has destroyed a lot of the evidence? Well, that, that is not the case, because the evidence of the decision-making process happens in, in a formal way, happens through Cabinet meetings, happens through notes which are taken. Any decision that's taken, a civil servant is there in the room, and all that information is documented, and all of that will be able to be accessed by the, the COVID inquiry. You know, when you talk about trust, there's a poll today in the Sunday Times. 32% of the public in Scotland trust Nicola Sturgeon, 25% Hamza Yusuf, far more than Rishi Sunak, I her, might her, say. She's on minus 19 in that poll, 
Mr Blackford. Yes, but you're talking about a woman that has the highest positive rating uh, across all of the It's negative. It's negative 19. It's, it, it, it is negative for every politician in that survey, Martin, so that's not unique. But the point is that Nicola is still trusted by a higher percentage of the population in Scotland than any other politician, bar none. Rishi Sunak on 16%, twice the rating uh, or half the rating that the, the former First Minister has. So let's put things into context. I understand the feelings of those that are of the bereaved, the families, that we have to make sure that the inquiry does its job. Let's make sure that we do that. But also let's remember that in this particular case, it's the UK government that took the inquiry to court to stop WhatsApp messages being published. Rishi Sunak hasn't handed over a single piece yeah. of evidence from WhatsApp. That so is, let's be proportionate when we look at these things. That is a valid point, Murdo Fraser. Let me come to you. It's been um, a bruising couple of weeks for the Scottish Government, but let's not forget this is the UK inquiry that, is, that, is, that has uncovered some fairly unpleasant findings about what was happening in Whitehall. Why should we trust the UK Government anymore? You're absolutely right. You know, when, when the inquiry was interrogating the UK Government, there were some very difficult and unsettling uh, revelations that were revealed you know, at that particular point. But there's two significant differences between the approach of the UK government and the approach of the Scottish government that we've learned over the past week. One is that it seems the Scottish government was involved in a deliberate attempt to cover up and not provide messages, despite promises being made by Nicola Sturgeon that information well, would be provided. Hang on, Boris and Johnson didn't hand over messages. Rishi Sunak didn't give them his phone. Well, he, he said he'd not backed up his phone when it, when it was changed on but several Does occasions. anybody believe that? How do you mean, do you understand? I've deliberate... never met anybody who's lost a WhatsApp message in my life. Well, uh, what we see from the SNP is despite Nicola Sturgeon promising that all information would be made available, there was a policy of deletion on her part, on the part of our deputy, John Swinney, on the part of senior officials, who we saw uh, this week revealed in WhatsApp messages joking with each other about the need to delete information that was passing uh, between them. So it wouldn't be accessed under freedom of information. So it seems this was a deliberate policy uh, of deleting information. But the other aspect of this is even more serious. And this, again, this is a point of difference between the Scottish and UK government. It now seems the Scottish government was using the pandemic for political gain, taking decisions not, not uh, in the best interests of the Scottish people or based on the science, but deliberately calculated to create difference with what was happening south of the border. And we saw that in the messages being revealed this, in the last week from uh, Liz Lloyd, the uh, uh, former First Minister's Chief of Staff, who said uh, she, she wanted to uh, create a good old-fashioned rammy. Well, yeah, let me pick you up on that, Murdo Fraser. I mean, she, uh, tired of talking about sick people. Yes, and, and what she, what the context, the context the she gave at the, the end of Scottish that government. was that she was facing, that the Scottish government were facing such obstruction from the UK government that sometimes it was worth generating a public spat because then you got public support behind you and eventually you got something done. Ian Blackford, you were in Westminster at that point. You were representing the SNP yeah. and presumably making over cheers to the Scottish Government. How do you feel, not just about that point, but about the broader atmosphere in cross-border relations? I mean, you guys will argue all day that one was blocking the other. Us poor saps here in the electorate are sitting in the middle thinking, crikey, were you not acting for us? Yeah, well, you know, I can tell you that the First Minister absolutely was. I was interacting with her on a very regular basis. And the one thing I can say, Martin, is that there was only one thing that the First Minister was focusing on, and that was the situation with COVID, making sure that people were getting the information that they required. I spoke about the press conferences that were taking place. Can you just think about everything that the First Minister would have to have done to prepare for that, speaking to our scientific and medical advisers? And if I contrast that with the chaos in Westminster, I think we can all remember the very occasional press conferences of Boris Johnson. I used to be brought in to have meetings with Boris along with other opposition leaders. And I have to say, and I, I, I say this with, uh, with regret more than anything else, you had a, a man there that was seriously unprepared for the challenges that we were facing. What a contrast with the First Minister that I think was providing comfort on a daily basis to so many people, not just in Scotland, but right across these islands. That's the difference about wanting well, the, to make the sure... The messaging was better, but was the performance any better? Are we well, going to find out at the end of this that we were actually any better off under your government than we would have been under... The UK government? 
I will say that there's no doubt that we made mistakes through this and we have to learn from that. And of course, we'll be judged by what comes out of that inquiry, Martin, but the desire was to take appropriate action at the right time. And we were hampered, let's be honest, um, about this view that the UK government were dragging their feet and going into lockdowns, for example. And of course we wanted to take decisions which were in step with the rest of the UK government. But it was difficult when you had a Prime Minister that was not responding as okay. fastly as he should have done. All right, Murdo Fraser, let me ask you this. Do we expect too much of our politicians? Are we, I mean, we need these inquiries, but actually they, they do kind of, when we look under the bonnet, tend to damage our trust. And we, firstly, do we expect too much of you guys? And secondly, what can you do to help repair some of this broken trust? That's fundamental to all this, isn't it? Well, well what we need, Martin, above all, is transparency. What, what we need to do is understand what decisions were being taken and why, and what the real life consequences were. And we're only able to do that if we have a full record. And what we see in the, in the inquiry in the last week is we are teasing some of this out now, but some information we simply don't have because it's been deleted. Uh, and that, I think, will hamper the ability uh, both of the, 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 the inquiry and of the public to understand the motivation base behind decisions that were taken, whether they were taken in the best interests of the people, on the best scientific and medical advice, or whether they were taken, as appears to be the case, for political reasons. And there are real life consequences to this. We've already seen the reaction from the uh, bereaved families. I can give you a personal example because I lost both my parents during the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, in the, in, in the, the case of both my father and mother, we had to have funerals with a maximum of 20 mourners sitting with face masks on and socially distant. And in the case of my mother, we weren't even allowed to invite the family for a cup of tea after the internment. Mm. And yet we, we accepted those rules because we believed at the time that that was the best scientific advice available and we were protecting the public. Now it appears that may not have been the case. Well, now it seems that decisions that were, were being made. Decisions yeah. were being made between the First Minister and her chief of staff on WhatsApp. Uh, in t well, that was revealed in the inquiry. Yeah, but, just but Murdo Fraser, those, those, those rules wouldn't have been different. We don't know if that was true. So no wonder people are angry Let me, in yeah. terms of what's coming out from the inquiry. If, sure, if, Murdo, if, if well, one second, Mr. Blackford. Murdo Fraser, just very, very, very briefly, ju just let me clear this up. You're not suggesting those rules would have been different um, had you been living south of the border, are you? Well, what, what I'm saying is we don't know now why those rules were put in place, whether they were the right sure. rules, we, we whether, will, we whether will it was in the done differently in Scotland just to be different from England, because well, we know one of the motivations was a political motivation to create difference, to pursue a constitutional Well, we, we think that's an allegation. Listen, Mr. Murdo Fraser, thank you, Mr. Blackford. Let me just come to you. Let me take the very first point that Murdo Fraser was making there, that scrutiny is absolutely essential. There is this phrase, isn't there? Sunlight or daylight is the best disinfectant. Mm. Shining a light into these things really helps us understand all of it. Do you really think that's the case? We have to do this process, but actually, will it harm our trust in politics at the end? Well, at, at the end of the day, we have to have full transparency. I think we all agree with that. We've got the UK quiet we also have a separate Scottish one, let's not forget. And also let's remember what the Scottish Government has done, has asked for a view on the rules over use of social media. That will happen, so we make sure that we take the right decisions to rebuild that trust in politics. But on this issue of funerals, and you know, I feel for anyone that had a loss over that period, Murdo and anyone else, but the rules that were put in place were put in place by the Cabinet on the advice of the scientific and medical community. What happened between the First Minister and our Chief of Staff was a discussion about how these things would be put across at the press conference is quite a different thing than what's been what's, what's been put across this morning. OK, well, listen, uh, th this is ongoing. We're two weeks into three weeks of evidence here in Scotland from the UK inquiry. As you say, there is a Scottish inquiry to go. Hopefully we will get all the answers and a better understanding of what happened. Whether that uh, in, in, enhances our trust in politicians or not, we, we shall see. Murdo Fraser, Ian Blackford, thank you very much indeed both for being with us this Sunday morning. Thank you.